this video, we're going to take a look at how the 6th century Christian monk Cosmas Indica Plustes defends the literal meaning of the Genesis story on several key points. Christians had been wrestling with the numerous weaknesses and problems in the Genesis story ever since the beginning of Christianity, and these flaws and improbabilities in Genesis were ridiculed by prominent pagan polemicists like Celsus, Porphyry, and others. So naturally, many Christian thinkers and theologians tried to defend the Genesis story in turn, and Cosmas, one of the most well travelled Christians of that early Byzantine period was one of those who commented on several of the obvious flaws and defects in the narrative. In his written work, Cosmas writes on several interesting issues. Firstly, that the earth has to be flat according to Genesis and the rest of the Bible, and not spherical as the Greek thinkers speculated, and he criticises the pagans heavily for this point of view. Secondly, why an all-powerful god took six days no less to create the earth rather than just wishing it into existence in an instant? What possible reason could there be for God to spend so much time in the process? Thirdly, why did God fail to kill Adam as he very specifically threatened to do should he eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Instead Instead, he injected him from the garden, which could be interpreted as either a lesser or a greater sentence, depending on your point of view. The salient point being God changing his mind, or at the very best, making an empty threat. Fourthly, why was God so apprehensive about Adam and Eve eating from the tree of life anyway, after they'd eaten from the tree of good and evil? Apprehensive enough to eject them summarily from the, the Garden of Eden, in case they tried to eat that fruit as well. And lastly, why was Eve created after Adam? Eve, in fact, was made very much as a, an afterthought, unlike the animals which were created all in an instant, both male and female. Surely God should have uh, created Eve at the same time as Adam, just like other forms of life, and as a sign of equality. By the way, this is the second in a series of videos on Genesis and its defence by early Christian church theologians against pagan attacks. And if you'd like to see how Oregon, the Christian thinker from the third century, tries to deal with the Criticism from Celsus. You can watch one of my earlier videos as well. The link is shown on the top right of the screen now. Also, this video is split into chapters, and if you'd like to skip ahead to a particular section, just go to the description section below and click on the links provided. So firstly, who was Cosmas? Well, he was a, a Christian merchant of the 6th century who, in his earlier life, travelled extensively across much of the Middle East, and then much further, going as far as Ethiopia, Eritrea, Yemen, and the Indian Ocean as well. In fact, he sailed as far as India, and even to Sri Lanka, or or uh, Ceylon in some of his travels, leaving short accounts of his journeys to these places in his book. The moniker he earned, Indica Plustis, means voyager to India, indicating perhaps the respect his travels were given by people of that time. So arguably one of the great travellers of that period, but in later years, Cosmos became a monk and elected to stay in Egypt where he wrote his book. And that book was called Christian Topography, where he argues his case against pagan thought, philosophy and ideas, amongst many other things. It's an interesting book being written in that particular period of great change. In one of the recent translations, the editor describes the unique age Cosmos was living in in quite a memorable way. Quote, he, meaning Cosmos, may thus not inaptly be compared to a two-headed Janus with one face turned to the light of departing day and the other to the shadows of the coming night. He was referring to the rapid approach of the Dark Ages with the Western Roman Empire having disappeared. Culture and thinking and philosophy and civilization in general was already declining in large parts of Western Europe, but there was still some fading light of Hellenic and pagan free thinking around in what was left of Greco-Roman culture of the Mediterranean of that time, a period that's called Late Antiquity. This was the age just before the arrival of Islam on the scene, and that classical culture would be finally extinguished as the Mediterranean basin was carved up by Christianity and an expanding Islam. Cosmos, as mentioned, was a, a strong critic of the pagans and paganism, which was still surviving tenuously during his time, and he pretty much dismissed the works of the great Greek thinkers of old. Quote, among the famous philosophers who flourished among the pagans, which of them, Socrates or Pythagoras or Plato or Aristotle or any other, was held worthy to foretell or announce anything of such advantage to the world as the resurrection of the dead and the free gift to men of the kingdom of heaven, which cannot be shaken. For they can announce nothing except only that by means of calculation and secular learning they declare when eclipses of the sun and the 
moon will occur, whereby even if they predict them truly, as in fact they do, no benefit will accrue to the world, but rather the evil of pride. His biggest criticism of the pagans was their belief in a spherical earth. Cosmos, like other Christians, believed in a flat earth, with heaven being above the firmament of the sky, as consistent with the various verses in the Bible. Cosmos himself was under the impression that the universe was like a box, with the earth as the lower layer and heaven as the upper layer, and vertical sides supporting heaven around the edges of the earth. Now the earth being a sphere was a, a direct challenge to the biblical two-layer model and therefore he spends the biggest portion of his writings ridiculing the idea, almost seeing it as his mission to debunk it. Hellenic learning and science were still seen as a threat it seems, which uh, had to be vigorously countered it in his opinion. And he busied himself with finding proof from the Bible for this belief while criticising the pagan ideas. Quote, Aristotle from the circularity of the earth's shadow in eclipses inferred the rotundity of the earth. For the famous sphere of the pagans does not harmonise at all with what Christian doctrine proclaims, but is adapted rather for those who hope neither for a resurrection of the dead nor for another state after it, but assert that the whole world is in an endless process of generation and corruption. And he certainly thought the idea of the earth being a sphere was pretty easy to debunk, citing many points in his book. Quote, for should anyone choose to examine closely the pagan theories, he will find them to be entirely fictitious, fabulous sophistries, and to be utterly impossible. They, meaning the pagans, din our ears and vomit out fictions and fables, unquote. Cosmos was essentially targeting the Christians who, though believing in Christianity, still had a healthy respect for Hellenic science and thinking. And he treated these people almost as counterfeit Christians, certainly believers who were not yet fully committed to Christian dogma and who preferred Greek science instead. And he warned Christians to avoid being contaminated by pagan Greek thinking and instead rely on the Bible for information regarding the universe. And he was certainly right in this regard, for the two ideas were entirely different. The pagans, he said, believed in a, a universe infinitely old and that was always changing and corruptible. They didn't believe in the resurrection of humans, rather that the physical body too was corruptive and destined to return to atoms. Instead, many believed in the transmigration of the soul and, and so pagan belief was entirely incompatible with Christianity. Edward Gibbon would use Cosmos as a source when writing The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire and valued his information regarding his travels, but he had little time for Cosmos's religious belief in a flat earth. Quote, the nonsense of the monk was nevertheless mingled with the practical knowledge of the traveller, unquote. He wrote, summing up his feelings on the monk. To keep this video to a reasonable length, I'll be covering his objections to a spherical earth in much more detail in another video. In this video we'll take a look into his views specifically on the Genesis narrative and rather than questioning the entire foundations of the narrative we'll take the Genesis story at face value. In other words we'll assume creatures like angels and talking snakes that are a Christian paradise called Eden with its various trees of knowledge and of life all exist or existed. So let's take a look at the first issue how Cosmos tries to tackle the over lengthy time of six days that the Genesis story describes as God taking for the formation of the earth. Quote, perhaps again someone will ask, why did he make the whole creation not in one or two or three or four or five, but in six days? Unquote, he wrote. Well, Cosmos has a, a rather surprising explanation for the six days. He speculates this was actually done for the benefit of the angels. These supernatural creatures had to be clearly shown what was happening, otherwise the angels would have been confused as to how everything came into being if it had happened in an instant. Quote, the angels are rational and mutable. One day would not have sufficed for their instruction if the whole had been produced in one day, for they would have certainly have thought that things had been confusedly brought into existence like so many phantasms and been produced in disorder. But God Almighty, having set apart one day for each single work, in due order formed the universe in parts, that it might be discriminated and thus better understood by the angels." Unquote. So Cosmos is arguing that the creation process was deliberately slowed down so the angels with their limited understanding and intelligence could fully comprehend what was happening and how creation occurred. And it was for this reason that God made the heaven and the earth first, then light, then the firmament, the plants and animals, fish and fowl in a particular order. Quote, on this account, therefore, he made the whole world by parts in the six days for the discrimination and instruction of the angels who from their acute intelligence were able to do each day discriminate each separate part of the work and the maker thereof, unquote. And that would also, according to Cosmos, explain why God is apparently written as talking to himself during the creation of the universe. There are various verses in Genesis 1 where he is declaring out aloud, let there be light or let there be firmament, etc. In fact, in Genesis 1 verse 22, he even talks to the animals, telling them to be fruitful and multiply. This talking out loud was really to drum in what was happening into the minds of the angels who were 
watching and listening to him as the earth was being made, over and above what he was showing them. If they weren't being instructed, Cosmas wrote, then there would be no need for God to speak the words. The problem with his arguments on this issue are that Cosmas sees God as a, a fairly limited creature, not being able to manage to do things in an instant for one reason or another. Not only that, but the angels he has created are shown as being pretty dim-witted. Surely watching creation being done instantly wasn't beyond their understanding. If God is showing the angels the stages of creation and the angels are watching as it's taking place, then surely barking out commands is also entirely unnecessary as their eyes can see what is happening before them. And declaring, let there be light or let there be firmament, certainly isn't adding much value or extra information to the proceedings. But the bigger question that comes immediately to mind is why God is unable simply to infuse this knowledge into the minds of the angels without having to physically go through this elaborate show and taking things step by step. And perhaps just as importantly, it still doesn't explain why six whole days were necessary. Surely this process, if it had to be done in stages for some reason, could have been completed in a few minutes or say an hour or two. Were the angels so deficient in intellect that to recognise and understand what was happening, each step had to be done slowly and on a separate day. Commenting further on the issues of the stages of creation, Cosmos explains that the humblest of creatures were created first, with the pinnacle of God's creation, man himself created last. So grass, herbs, fruit trees, etc. came first, followed by fish and fowl, then cattle, followed by creeping things, and then finally beasts of the earth. And only after all this was man created. Why this particular order had to be necessary, he doesn't explain. But as with Christians in general, he had a, a firm belief in man being in the image of God and the only creature to be sentient. That man was a special creation, therefore, and naturally above all other forms of life in value. And that creation was, in essence, designed only for him, especially heaven in the afterlife. Quote, man alone of all the animals on the earth, being rational and destined for heaven, received from the creator a figure in congruity with such a destiny, for he is a biped, being destined to fly away and walk in heaven. In figure he is erect, as if he were ready and destined to ascend on high, unquote. Another issue Cosmos comments on is why God didn't kill Adam after he ate from the tree, when he specifically and very explicitly threatened Adam with death in his instructions. But in the event, he didn't carry out the death sentence when he found Adam had eaten the fruit. So at worst, God told a lie and never planned to kill him anyway, or at the very best, it was an empty threat. But surely God is truth and could not lie, and if we assume it was an empty threat, then why make the threat in the first place, knowing he would never carry it out? Cosmos explains this fairly half-heartedly, in my opinion, by arguing that God was being frank, but he decided to let Adam off the hook by merely chastising him. Quote, when he did transgress, did not immediately visit him with death in accordance with the threatening, but was long-suffering towards him, and having disciplined him by means of the law, and cast him out of paradise, and permitted him to live to a good old age before he died, God showed great forbearance and kindness towards man, particularly in having provided him with clothing, and in that he did not in wrath inflict death upon human nature, but instructed man in prudence and wisdom, and made sin hateful to him and righteousness the object of his desires, unquote. Now this is an obviously unsatisfactory answer. Firstly, it doesn't answer the issue of the empty threat. Cosmos puts it down to God being tolerant of Adam's faults. However, casting somebody out of a, a perfect paradise and only providing the barest minimum, some clothing of animal skin, can hardly be called tolerant. Whichever way you look at it, it was a punishment, but importantly, it wasn't the punishment that had been promised. He also suggested God allowed him to live to a good old age before he died, so in one way he did keep his promise to kill him, but he simply delayed the execution of the punishment. Cosmos puts this down to God, quote, instructing man in prudence and wisdom, unquote. But banning him from eating the fruit seems a, a pretty strange and roundabout way to begin the instruction of man, assuming he needed any guidance in the first place. And of course, it's at variance with Genesis 3, where it's clearly written that God ejected Adam because he was anxious about Adam eating the fruit of the tree of life. But in order to answer this particular problem, Cosmos seems to just kick the can further down the road. To explain God ejecting Adam and Eve from Eden before they had the opportunity to eat from the tree of life. This was Cosmos writes to ensure man would keep hankering for immortality, which he would in due course receive in heaven. But to give immortality to man earlier than necessary would divorce him from love and aiming for perfection. So immortality would be a reward for good behaviour. Cosmos therefore gives the casting out of Adam and Eve from paradise as positive a spin as possible, that it was for their own good in the end. 
Finally, and perhaps most interestingly, how does Cosmos deal with the issue of why Eve wasn't created at the same time as Adam? She was created from Adam's rib, almost as an afterthought, and she is in general treated much more shabbily than Adam in the story. For example, in Genesis 2, she's called a helpmeet, which literally means a, a helpful partner or a help suitable for him. In other words, her function is largely as a companion rather than being a human on par in dignity and worth with Adam. Secondly, Eve is also made from the rib of Adam rather than the same process used to make Adam, that of God breathing through Adam's nostrils. The Genesis account gives no reason for this different and much inferior form of creation. Thirdly, God tells Adam not to eat from the tree before he creates Eve and then signally fails to tell Eve this instruction. Eve is also shown as a, a weaker willed being, specifically targeted by the snake who doesn't even attempt to address Adam. And of course she's shown as tempting Adam in turn. But importantly, she's given much more of a curse than Adam, who also ate the apple, being told she will give birth to children in pain and that, quote, he, meaning Adam, will rule over her, unquote. And that means she is effectively inferior to Adam. And there's no equality of sexes in Genesis 3. So all in all, she gets a much worse deal than Adam, even though she was created as a, a helpmeet for him. Cosmos poses a question himself. Quote, someone again may propose a question and say, why was it that while all the irrational animals were created by God, male and female at the same time, man alone was not created with the female, but remained quite solitary until the female was made later on? And his explanation for this is a, a variation of the same answer as the one given for the creation of the earth in six days. But in this case, the beneficiary is Adam. So just like the angels had to be shown the stages of creation for them to appreciate how creation was done and for them to look up to their maker and his power. So in this case, Adam had to be shown the power of God as well in the creation of one thing or another. Now, since Adam was created the very last of all things, he didn't have the benefit of seeing some or all of creation being carried out. For all he knew, God had not created a, a single thing. So the creation of Eve from his rib would give him a show of God's power, just like the angels were shown creation taking place. Quote, it was necessary that a man who had been created by God possessed of reason and as the bond uniting all the creation should himself be taught to know the creator of all. But since as he was not the first but the last of all to be produced, he could neither from the things made before him nor from himself know God. It was God's pleasure to produce the female, not along with him, but afterwards, out of him, uh, that he might thereby know that he who had taken out from him a being like himself was his creator, unquote. Strangely enough, Cosmos, in comparing Eve's creation with the angels, seems to miss an important point. He writes, quote, As then the angels had been created rational, and from the works produced in the six days had been taught to know him who was the cause of them, so of necessity man also was taught through the female and learned that God was the maker both of himself and of the universe. But especially as he had beforehand heard God say, let us make a help meet for him, unquote. But what he misses is that while the angels were shown creation in stages, Adam was actually put to sleep by God and therefore never gets to see the act of creation of Eve. So these two things can hardly be compared and he invalidates his own point. And of course his explanation being the same as the one for creation being shown to angels has the same flaws. Why can't Adam simply be infused with the knowledge that God is his creator rather than being shown Eve's creation? And as for Eve being created in a, a much humbler way, being created from Adam's rib, Cosmos tries to give this action a positive spin. He argues that this was done so Adam and Eve would have some sort of kinship, Eve being created from Adam and therefore off his flesh. Quote, God, moreover, made the woman from the man's side, because the two sides bind the whole body close together. For he neither made her from the front of man, lest the woman should exalt herself above him, nor from his back parts, that he might not exalt himself above the woman, but from his side, as being in her nature his equal. Unquote. Here he is wrong, of course, as the ribs extend all round the body, and therefore form the front, side, and back of a human. So this argument seems to be entirely nonsensical. Cosmos also writes that God put Adam into a trance when he took out the rib, so that he wouldn't feel any pain but that after waking up would afterwards appreciate what God had done in making a companion for him out of his own body, rather than conjuring up Eve out of nothing. But this explanation still doesn't address the way Eve is shown as very much inferior, for the attention in Genesis chapter 2 is all on Adam being shown God's power, with poor Eve not getting much of a say at all, or even being present rather than Eve being given the same status as Adam. And of course Cosmos doesn't use the same logic for Eve as he does for Adam, 
Why isn't God showing Eve in turn his power by creating something from her and so on? Surely Eve should appreciate her maker's power in the same way as Adam. So there you have it, some of the thinking that Cosmos puts forward to justify the weaknesses in the Genesis creation story. As with the other early Christian theologians, he did believe in taking the story literally and therefore it required the above explanations. I'm not sure his arguments particularly stand up if we consider God to be omniscient and all-seeing and all-knowing. Rather, the God of the Bible, always shown as anthropomorphic and limited in nature and intellect, comes across as being rather at the mercy of events and reacting to them as and when they happen, rather than being in charge and controlling events and destiny. And Cosmos's reasons, especially for Eve being treated as an afterthought, are uh, particularly weak. But I hope this video was of use, and as mentioned, I will be doing another video on Cosmos, and that will be on his numerous reasons based on the Bible for the Earth being flat rather than a sphere. So I hope you'll tune into that. And if you did like this video and you'd like to see more content like this, be sure to click the like and uh, subscribe buttons uh, below.